Blasphemy. To those who have read the Bible, the mere mention of this word wreaks damnation and sends a frightening shiver down the spine of those who know that the day is coming when God shall bring each and every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. In the 12th chapter of Matthew, Yeshua, Jesus, confronts the Pharisees and states, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. On January the 21st of 1885, Charles Haddon Spurgeon delivered a sermon to his congregation at the New Park Street Chapel in London, England. He stated, Oh, there is no crime on earth so black as the crime against the Holy Spirit. You may blaspheme the Father, and you shall be damned for it, unless you repent. You may blaspheme the Son, and hell shall be your portion, unless you are forgiven. But blaspheme the Holy Ghost, and thus saith the Lord. There is no forgiveness, either in this world, nor in the world which is to come. So just what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? In Numbers, the 15th chapter, it states that the person who sins intentionally, whether a native or a foreigner, blasphemes, dishonoreth, reproacheth, reviles, insults Yahweh. That person shall be cut off from his people for he has despised the word, the law, the covenant of Yahweh, and has broken, effaced, had no respect for, made void his commandments. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity, his lawlessness, his sin shall be on him. You may be saying, but that definition of blasphemy is a quote from the Old Testament. But wait just a minute. Let's see what's written in the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews states that if we intentionally keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, which is the law, the covenant, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the adversaries of God. He goes on to state that anyone who rejected despised the law of Moses, died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant, the law, that sanctified them, and who has insulted, done despite to, trampled, rejected with disdain, uh, profaned, blasphemed the spirit of grace. This raises a very important question. Who are the adversaries of God that will be consumed by a raging fire? According to what we just read, the answer is those who intentionally keep on sinning after coming to a knowledge of the truth, which is the law, the covenant. This raises a second question. What is sin? 
The answer to that question is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. He states that whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. In other words, sin is transgression, breaking of the law, the covenant. James states in chapter 4, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Listen very carefully to what I'm about to share with you. It is mostly overlooked or intentionally ignored that the Old Testament sacrifices atoned for unintentional sins committed in ignorance. These were the sins that were forgiven. The same is true with regard to the atoning sacrifice of Yeshua, Jesus. He died for our past sins committed in ignorance. This is why Peter pleads, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. The writer of Hebrews goes on to tell us in chapter 10, he says, For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Unless you think otherwise, listen to what David wrote in his very first Psalm, the fifth verse, when he stated, For this cause shall the lawless not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. According to the second epistle of Peter, it is by God's divine power that he gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And through the knowledge of him, we understand that he has called us to glory in a life of virtue, which is moral excellence, modesty, purity, goodness, and righteousness, having a sincere love for God and his laws. We are told that he has given us exceeding great and precious promises, whereby we are partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. It is by grace we are empowered to keep the law, the covenant, and not make it the excuse and justification for breaking it. What I am about to share with you is heartbreaking. People just don't know. At the very heart of the new covenant is the indwelling of the Spirit who empowers and causes the true children of Yahweh to walk in His laws and keep His ordinances. Those who deride and turn their backs to the law and the ordinances of God oppose and blaspheme the very work of the Holy Spirit.